Hello, I'm Paul Kasabian and I'm a structural engineer. And we're talking about how to understand structures. And as part of that, I always think it's helpful to look at the structures in the world around us, to compare them, to, to see the differences between them. And before I show some of these, I do want to say, highly aware that the choices we make as a society for the built structures that surround us are not driven by only structural behavior. There are a lot of needs above those that drive many of the decisions on what they are, how they behave, not just structurally, how they look, how they're perceived by others. So understanding some very critical elements that can drive what something is, I think it's still helpful to at least be aware of what they mean structurally, right? So that we have an understanding of that piece. That's the part that I think is important. I actually wanted to start with a building that I used to see um, uh, when I was on the bus going to school and watching it get built. It's the Sainsbury Wing next to the National Gallery at Trafalgar Square in London. And on this side, you can see, uh, this is uh, the facade of the building. You're seeing columns. They're very sort of closely in, in space next to each other, not in a very standard way. And it's probably obvious to everyone that those are not structural columns. This is essentially uh, a facade, um, decoration on the exterior of the building. In fact, if you go around the corner down the side street where the, um, it's actually a brick uh, facade. Um, in many ways, actually, this building is part of the architectural intent. Um, it essentially acts as a bit of a mirror um, to the buildings that are opposite it. The structure is inside. It's, it's hidden. It works. It's safe. And architecturally, what you see on the outside is a facade, an architectural set of choices. That's fine. And here, I'm going to contrast it with another museum, the Pompidou Centre in Paris. Now, a lot of people uh, at the time it was built, and still today, feel that it is somewhat ugly or harsh and not in keeping with Paris. And again, that is not the discussion that I would like to have right now, so much as to point out in, in contrast, the structure of this building is very much on show. The exterior of the building, everything you're seeing, is the building structure which, of course, is not very typical for buildings, but it's certainly very interesting. And this side view, um, in fact, shows a lot of what's going on. For these very long spans, it's taken at the end in a push-pull, so compression and then tension, um, to balance out the ends of these very long span trusses. It's a fascinating building. It's very sort of obvious in how it works. Also a museum, but in many ways an interesting uh, visual clarity to the structure. And I want to take a moment to talk for a second about structural honesty. This is something that a lot of people talk about and often sort of say that a building should be structurally honest. And I think to some extent that's supposed to mean that if something looks like structure, it is the structure. And for my personal opinion, I think there's, as I've said, some issues that are above structure for the reasons that we build the buildings and infrastructure around us. And also for reasons we'll get into as we go, things it's maybe not always so clear what structural honesty or a pure structure might be, or even why it would then be perfectly useful. Um, after all, at some point we need flat floors, and one might argue that those are not structurally honest. They don't express the forces in them. So just wanted to take that moment here while we're going. So I love this one. This, uh, this is, you may have seen these around, this is uh, an antenna, right, for signals. And clearly, uh, whoever was in charge felt that the antenna itself wasn't good enough to look at. And they have chosen to design, manufacture and install cladding around the antenna to make it look like a tree. And pretty sure all of us can tell that's not a tree. But still, someone's chosen to do this. So we have structure covered. Fine. And it's essentially covered by yet another structure with little cantilever branches coming out. 
And I'd like to contrast this with another antenna, a radio antenna, the Eiffel Tower, right? Also quite controversial at the time it was built, currently essentially one of the symbols of Paris and France. Um, it's interesting how things can change over years and acceptability. Um, but very much uh, on view structure, right? It is, um, you can, it's the metal structure, there's no real cladding to this. Um, it, it's for overall form is, is essentially linked to how uh, the wind forces go on it. It tapers so that the wind at the top is less. It broadens at the base to be more stable against wind. But, you know, just, just while we're talking, the area down at the base, that arch-looking area down there, those parts that form the curve shape, those are decorative. Those are not necessary to the structure. But in terms of the overall form, you might consider that they are necessary to the look. It would, might look a little bit more harsh or industrial if it didn't have that. And I think many people might even think that they're structural. That's fine. But it is interesting to compare what, what you might have thought I was showing to you as a, a fully exposed structure still has some decorative elements on it. So I'm showing the Parthenon here. And I want to talk about it in the use of material. And I want to be very careful here, with, with all due respect to uh, my close friend, Yanni, and um, all Greeks, his ancestors, thank you for democracy and geometry. But let's talk about the Parthenon from a structural point of view. There are stone columns, and then there are stone beams. And stone doesn't do well as a beam. Stone doesn't do well in tension, Beams need to carry tension. So what you see are some very short spans of beams, which subsequently have very closely spaced columns. And again, the Parthenon was built and was meant to represent things above and beyond structure. But if we're talking about structure only, you can see here in the Temple of Zeus, also in Athens, top right, one of those stone beams has a crack in it, just at the area of maximum tension. So there are consequences to using and structural materials in a certain way or making certain design choices that we should be aware of. Right? Doesn't mean that it should drive the process or the design, but it needs to be part of it. But what if we understand how to work with a material like stone that works well in compression? What else could we do with it? If we choose to vault with stone, then you get something like King's College Chapel in Cambridge large open spans, it's maybe hard to see in the photograph, but wide spaced columns down the side with large stained glass windows, beautifully letting in, letting in light uh, into the interior. It's a, it's a magical, wonderful space to be in. Um, and this is with choices of how to use stone. And even further than this, let me show you a project by uh, the famous engineer Peter Rice. This is for the Seville Expo in 92, uh, where stone is used in a shape and a form with the loads applied to it, such that it is always maintained in compression. and just shows you what we generally think of as a heavy mass of material that stone has to be. Being able to work, span, hold its own weight safely, and yet be airy and light. So this is a fascinating way of thinking about the world around us, contributing to what the design might be and how parts of it behave within the whole of what the project should be.